Welcome to Surrender School, Emotional Sobriety Workshop. Exploring Emotional Sobriety. Welcome back. Today we're going to do Chapter 2, Exploring Emotional Sobriety. This is where Dr. Berger goes through and explains the concept a little bit more in depth. This, this chapter was packed. It was just packed full of information, so we're just going to dive in. On page 30, Dr. Berger started the chapter by telling us that emotional sobriety is a mental state in which we do not react to our changing emotions as though they were the governing facts of our lives. We learn to pay attention to what our emotions are telling us rather than just automatically reacting. Now, I have found that my emotions have so much to tell me. They are a vital source of information for me, but not in the way that I used to think they were a vital source of information. I used to think that my emotions were telling me if something was you know, good or bad or right or wrong, and that's not how I think of them anymore. Now, my emotions tell me things like, oh, I must be tired or I'm not doing enough self-care right now, or maybe my spouse is just scared and that's why she's saying what she's saying, right? So I see my emotions as a vital source of information for me. And, and I work with that on my higher power, my higher power and I together. We respect our emotions, but we don't treat them like they are an infallible guide to reality. I could not agree with this more. Sometimes my emotions lie to me. They really lie to me. Like when they say things like, I'm gonna die if I don't eat this, or I am never gonna feel okay unless I binge, okay? All of those are lies. I'm going to starve between breakfast and lunch. All of those things are, are lies. So I think it's really important. We don't disregard our emotions. And sometimes they are telling us something of vital importance and they're not lying, but we have to have the awareness to actually look at it and work with our higher power on it and sometimes call other people or our sponsor on it so that we can kind of work through that and see if what they're telling, if what the emotions are telling us is actually true or not. Dr. Berger lists three main characteristics of emotional sobriety. The first is having an emotional center of gravity. The second is having emotional independence or autonomy. And the third is having emotional maturity. Okay, so first, what does having an emotional center of gravity actually mean? It means knowing who we are, regardless of what other people say or do. It is a firm and flexible inner sense of self. The emotional center of gravity means we are balanced and self-aware. We know who we are and who we aren't. We focus mainly on what we actually have control over, which is our own actions and attitudes and not other people's. He boils this down to self-awareness, self-acceptance, and self-support. Those three are very important. When our emotional center of gravity is placed or focused outside of ourselves, it really negatively affects our behavior, makes us impulsive, reactive, controlling, manipulative, unbalanced. So for example, if I place my emotional center of gravity in my boss, then I will be at my boss's mercy for my emotional well-being. So I can't be happy unless he praises me and I will be devastated if he criticizes me. I am the victim of his emotional whims. And victim is the operative term there. The second characteristic of emotional sobriety is emotional autonomy or emotional independence. This means we depend on ourselves to maintain our own emotional well-being. We don't give away our emotional balance to the words, actions, or emotional states of other people. We learn to use our own resources to cope with life. We take responsibility for asking for help when we need it and are open to feedback, but 
We decide what fits and what doesn't, what feedback fits for us and what feedback doesn't. We don't just assume that the other person is right. The more we take responsibility for our own change, the less we are going to demand that our loved ones change. And that's so important, I'm gonna read it again. The more we take responsibility for our own change, the less we demand that our loved ones change. What other people think and say about us doesn't define us. Everyone is entitled to their opinion, but it doesn't necessarily make it right. You know what they say about opinions. We don't listen to the self-critical and blaming voices in our heads either when we have a, an emotional center of gravity. We don't allow them to sabotage our recovery by telling us we're worthless and don't deserve recovery. I thought that for a long time. I thought I wasn't capable of recovery. The third characteristic of emotional sobriety is emotional maturity. This is about moving away from emotional dependency and towards self-support. On pages 36 and 37, Dr. Berger teaches us what emotional maturity is by explaining what it isn't. When we are emotionally dependent on others, we feel driven to manipulate them to support us. We need them to do those things. When we depend on others to satisfy our needs, we lose influence over our own emotional well being. Being emotionally immature means our personal value relies on the validation of others. We are okay or not okay based on how others feel or behave. That's really being a victim. When our emotional stability rests on expectations of how things should be, then our happiness is entirely dependent on getting our own way. I'm gonna read that one again, okay? When our emotional stability rests on expectations of how things should be, then our happiness is entirely dependent on getting our own way. That was one of the keys to me being upset about being upset. I shouldn't be upset. I shouldn't have to be upset. It's a big, huge waste of energy. Dr. Berger on the bottom of page 38 and on to 39, he introduces an interesting concept called the unenforceable rule. This is a rule we make regarding how other people are supposed to act or feel or how the world is supposed to work. And it's unenforceable because we have no control over those things, right? He says, we make these rules to feel safe, but really we are just trying to control the uncontrollable, which always leads us back to the food or your substance of choice. Unenforceable rules are just expectations. And you know what they say about expectations. They are just premeditated resentments. So in the book, uh, in the chapter, Dr. Berger uses the example of Sam and her mom, Jennifer. And he brings up a vital point about emotional sobriety. He says that Sam and Jennifer were only able to see their own points of view. They interpreted everything the other person said through their own expectations, demands, beliefs, and fears. They made it all about themselves. And they made the other person's reactions mean something that wasn't meant. And we all do this. We all do this. And, you know, some people call it mind reading. When we make all these kinds of assumptions about why someone said that, why someone did that. And we make it mean all this big stuff in my head when it could have meant they really needed to go to the bathroom and they had to leave the conversation quickly so they could get there, which has nothing to do with us. Okay, I often see this kind of thing come up in fourth steps. This whole, the assumption thing, making things mean what they really don't. Um, I see that a lot in four steps. And to me, this is the very definition of self-centeredness, self-importance, self-preoccupation. It's when we can't get past the, our own end of our nose to see further out. 
We're incapable of putting ourselves in the other person's shoes. It's like the definition of being self-absorbed that we can't see that. Emotional sobriety helps us react based on reality, not based on our expectations, projections, and assumptions. Based on reality, not just the stories we are telling ourselves. We are reacting and behaving and saying things and thinking about things because that's what's really happening, not what we think or tell ourselves is happening. That's really tricky. That takes a lot of awareness and program is so good at helping us do that. Working through the steps, the step work is phenomenal at teaching us how to do that. On page 4344, Bill W's equation for emotional sobriety was maturity plus balance equals humility. That was his equation for emotional sobriety. Having humility means that we realize we are not that important. We are not the center of everyone else's universe. We may be the center of ours, and that's fine, but we are not the center of anyone else's universe. And we have no business expecting others to live up to our expectations for them. Dr. Berger called humility the antidote to the poison of emotional dependency. We have to be humble to cast aside the childish belief that we're at the center of the universe and that other people should conform to our expectations to think and behave the way we want them to. It really is, you know, there's so much uh, emotional baggage attached to the word humility because it's the, you know, the base for humiliation. And I think a lot of people feel there's like a moral, uh, like a moral character flaw in them if they're selfish. No, it's just that that's the way they learn to cope and that's how they learn to do things. And growing up and maturing and becoming um, emotionally sober is about letting go of that and maturing into a more mature way of looking at the world, other people, my place in the world, all of that. So there's no moral condemnation in, in recognizing that we have these character defects, that we do think of ourselves as the center of the universe. Let's be honest, most people never grow out of that. You don't see a tremendous amount of emotional sobriety in the world. You really don't, because it's, it's work. And it does require maturity. It does require the willingness to grow up and let go of some few cherished childish beliefs. Um, then Dr. Berger goes into an explanation of the stage one, stage two recovery stuff that Ernie Larson um, put together, which is awesome stuff, by the way, but I'm not going to go into depth here on that. Um, what I will say is that um, a future book club, we do plan on doing one of Ernie Larson's books, um, Destination Joy, moving beyond fear, loss, and trauma and recovery. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, he's, he's a great thinker. So, But I'm, I'm not going to go into the stage one, stage two stuff at this point. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead to page 49. Dr. Berger ends the chapter with an expanded definition of emotional sobriety. Emotional sobriety means, first, gaining freedom from our emotional dependency. Second, accepting life on life's terms, letting go of demands and expectations. Third, discarding our old ideas about how everything and everyone is supposed to be. Fourth, developing an alignment with reality, coming into alignment with what really is, not what we think should be happening or not what we think is supposed to be happening, but what is actually happening. Fifth, claiming our experiences rather than letting them claim us. I don't know about you, but for most of my life, I would have a bad emotional experience and it would blow me over for days. I mean, I could binge for a week on a bad day at work. And that's, that's a crappy way to live. Number six is not being overly influenced by our emotions, what others say and do, or by what happens. And the last 
expansion of emotional sobriety is understanding that healthy relationships are based on who the people actually are, not on some unrealistic ideal or fantasy of what these relationships should be. I mean, your four step, go down your resentment list. It's all the relationships of people in your life that aren't doing what you thought they should do, right? Okay, that's all I've got for today. I'm ready to do questions. See you next week.